All right, so we are going to talk about ways to customize MemoQ. Um, I will leave some time at the end of the session so that you can ask your questions. You can always put them into the questions window. If there is something that deals with the topics that I'm talking about and I t um, see the question right away, I will answer it, of course, directly. Otherwise, I'll an answer it at the end of the session. So, you should now be seeing my screen. MemoQ is up and I have the view that you would see as a translator. Now, starting from this view, we can already customize things. So, for example, here is this show project lists only, the same one as this small icon here, where you can switch between just showing the list of the projects, if you have lots of projects and you don't want to see those big icons at the top, or you can switch them back on again. Another thing is that you could um, show the projects in a different way. So right now, each project in my list has one line of text. So the project name, the size, the status, the progress, and so on. But there is also this two-row view where I can switch it on like this. That means I have the project name and the languages right underneath it. So if that is something that's more useful or overused, looks better to you, you can always switch between um, showing one line or two lines per project. For each project, you can show details. Also might be interesting. So you get the metadata that might have been set, what kind of a project it is, how many documents are in the, in the project, what languages have been set, um, especially for project managers who deal with multilingual projects, that this might be a very useful way to show the projects. So that's the customization of the dashboard. There's one point missing, and that would be, for example, the dashboard here, the actual the messages that you can get. So sometimes it's really nice to see all these messages, but if you have a small screen, you might not want to see all the messages, or sometimes it's just um, bothering you that you have some, some text there and you don't want to read that. To switch off the connection, that's actually an internet connection going to the MemoQ website, getting all the information, um, to switch that off, you would need to go to the options. And the options is a part where we do a lot of things when we talk about customization. So the options would be that small um, icon with the gear wheels up here. And the options would then give you let's see here in the updates and news, you could customize that you don't want to see all those messages. You will have to uh, close MemoQ once and open it up again. Let me just apply the change. Some of the changes only apply when you close MemoQ and start it up again. So here we go. Now the dashboard does not show any of the news feeds anymore, so it's just empty space and you don't get distracted. Another thing that I actually forgot to tell you about the uh, projects, I wanted to tell you that you can also customize the columns that you see here. So right now we see the column for the name, for the size, for the status and so on. First of all, you can move them. So if the size of the project, you want to have that in front, you can move it up here or move it back again. And also with the right mouse click, you can customize what columns you really see. Because, for example, if you have only um, local projects you create yourself and you don't use a deadline, then why would you want to see the column with the deadline? So you can take that off. Or if you're not using any of the metadata, you can take them out of the list as well. Or if you're not using the client metadata, but maybe the domain, then you can customize it to show the fields that you want to see. So make it as, as useful as possible uh, when you look at the list of the projects so that you find things right away. Now let's go a little bit more into the settings um, that have to do with languages. First of all, we have the user interface language which in my case at the moment is English. Again, if I go to the options and check the category for 
appearance. Here you could switch the user interface language. There are quite a lot of languages available. Um, if there are other languages that are needed, if enough people tell Kilgrey that the language is needed, they might go into that language as well. So if you feel that your language is missing, try to tell them. And if enough people tell them, you might have a chance to get your language here. Again, if you change the language, you will have to close MemoQ and open it up again for the change to take effect. Another change or another customization setting, if you create a new project. So if I create a new project, just very simple new project, I have to select my languages, right? Now in this case, you can see that the languages, there are some languages at the top of the list. Um, so I don't have to scroll through the whole list of languages because I've put the languages that I use mostly at the top of the list. So that is something that you can do. Again, we'll have to do that in the settings, in the options. So let's go back to the options. And that's one of the miscellaneous settings. And here is a whole tab for the languages. You need to check the box to show the preferred languages at the top of the list. It could be, and this is for project managers, usually the recently used languages, the ones that you have used in the last few days. If you want to have a specific number of languages up there, you just say, I want to use these languages, and then select the ones you want to use. For me, that was the Chinese and English and German and so on. So that would be um, whenever you create a new project, the languages list would come up with those preferred languages at the top. The same would go if you create um, a term base or if you do some uh, importing into a term base and you have to assign the fields, so the columns from your import file to the languages in your term base. Also the term base uh, or the uh, language fields that are used in the term base would come up at the top of the list. So not that much scrolling around. So these would be some of the settings in the options. Now let's go inside of a project. I've prepared a small project for that. And we'll go into the customization document. We just see the regular editor. Um, you can also see that I have switched the pane down here to show the preview. Now the, the view pane, that is something I've seen that quite a lot of times that people accidentally have switched it off and then don't find it back. So that is something that you would find in the view menu. And here just click on the view pane and it comes back. Now not everybody likes to have the view pane at the bottom of the screen. And you will see that the view pane is the only one that we can move around. So here we have these small dots. If I move, move my mouse pointer over, it goes from an arrow to that um, four-pointed arrow. That means that this whole thing can be moved around. So if I grab it, just click and hold the button, you can see I get these icons where I can say where do I want to attach it? At the bottom, at the top, maybe more to the left or to the right, to the right of my results list, or maybe to the left of everything. Well, let's just move it there. So you can move the pane to different places. Move it up here. However you like to do it. Now let's move that back to the side because what you could see here, again, you have the three panes. So it, it doesn't change in functionality. It only changes the place where you have it. Now there is another way to change the layout of the editor, and that's here the current layout setting. So the current layout setting means that we have two layouts at the moment. The default one, that's the one that you usually have when you um, open MemoQ, or it would be the one that you have changed to, like I did just now. And the other one would be where it says results on top. So results on top means that the results list, which is usually on the right-hand side, comes up 
at the top of the screen, so we'd have the translation results. If I click on one sentence here, I get the translation results list up on the left-hand side. Then the window with the, the sentences from the document and the translation from the translation memory, as well as all the metadata for that translation sentence. So let's switch back. I'll switch back to the default. And if I want to switch back all the way to the default that MemoQ usually comes with, that would be reset the current one, so reset it to the default that MemoQ usually has. Another thing that people sometimes like to set is um, the active row. So the active row is the one that is marked with that orange frame, right? As if I move down and I translate at the end of the file, well, let's make it a little bit smaller. So if I'm here, well, let me see what kind of setting I have. Anyway. Uh, sometimes it happens that you have a long document, but you are always in that last, um, in that last cell of the list. You cannot see what is below that um, unless you scroll down or take a look at the, at the view. So in that case, it can be um, easier to move the frame to always the middle of the screen. So let me just move that down a little bit. So that would be the active row is in the middle. Translation goes right to left. So that means if I have this sentence, I confirm this sentence, confirm this sentence, oops, put something in here, confirm this sentence, it would still stay always in the middle of the screen and not keep going to the end of the screen. Now another thing, and um, this comes from the time when MemoQ came to market, Trados was very strong. And Trados was using a different kind of setup, so you would not have the sentences side by side. So source sentence on the left-hand side and the target sentence then on the right-hand side, but you would have the sentences above each other. So first a row with the source sentence and below that you would type your target sentence. And a lot of people still prefer that way of working. And for that you could change the active row to where it says in the middle but horizontal. And here you can see segment number six now has two rows. It has the row for the source sentence and it has the row for my translation. Let's go to another sentence where it's easier to see. Um, here's my translation. If I save that, the sentence that I've just saved goes back to this side-by-side -side view. Here you can see it, left-hand side, right-hand side. But the sentence that I actually want to translate will always be shown in this one above the other setting. So if you rather like to work that way, that's how you can switch. So that would be in the middle horizontal setting. Let me see if there are any questions right now. Question, how do I get back to the translation grid after having searched in source or target box? So I guess you mean if you put in a search up here, like you say, I want to see all the sentences that have the word new in them, and then press enter, and have a filtered list. There are two ways of doing that, either deleting that and pressing enter, or you could just uh, undo the filter with that small red X that takes off all the filtering that you've done, so then you come back to the whole list of sentences. Okay, there's also a question on the difference between recent and active projects. Um, let me go back to the list of the projects. So that would be the setup here. Um, the recent projects are the one that have been, um, that have the latest deadline no longer than in 30 days. So it's, it's something that's in the immediate time frame that you're working on in MemoQ. 
the active projects are the one that really are being worked on and active projects are the ones that have not been wrapped up. So in the end, when you do a project wrap up, you might have seen that at the very right hand side of your project list, there is this empty column. If you move your mouse pointer over it, you see those icons. And there is one, um, well, let's see, a wrap up project. It's not in here. The wrap up would be with uh, projects that were created out of templates. And a wrapped up project would um, disappear from the list, so it would not be an active project anymore. It would only show up if you set it to all projects. But the active projects are the ones that have not been finished yet, not been wrapped up yet. So let me see, any more questions? How to change the active segment from edit mode, with the cursor showing, to highlight mode? where the whole segment row is marked? That's a good question. I'm not really sure I know what you mean here. Let me go back into my project. So the question would be that this part of the editor should show a highlighted row, not just a frame. If you could just... Um, let me know. Or do you mean that if you want to select a whole row by clicking on the row number so that everything is highlighted? If you then click into the text again, it's not highlighted any longer. Okay, we'll come back to that. So I would like to, before I go into the next questions, I would like to show you a little bit more because I do have quite a lot of things that I would like to show. Um, and that is also maybe quite interesting for those of you who like to customize their ribbons because now in this version of MemoQ it is possible to adjust the ribbons. So not all of them, but the quick access bar, the one that MemoQ thinks or Kilgrade thinks that translators would mostly use. And you can see here we have certain areas, something for searching, for storing, for comments, for formatting tags, and so on. Now, I find that I would like to have in this ribbon also a way to start my QA check. I don't want to switch the ribbons, so I want to add an area that I can just click to start the QA check. And that is something you would just go to the quick access bar, do a right mouse click on it, and then you can say, I want to customize my ribbon. Then you get an extra dialog. These are the three uh, toolbars that can be, or the three ribbons that can be customized. It would be the quick access um, bar. It's that small toolbar with the, the few icons up here. And if you have a project management license, uh, there would also be a workflow ribbon that can be customized. So let's see. If I open that up, I can see for each of the areas that I have on my ribbon, I have basically a folder that contains the functionalities. So I need to add a new folder. They call it a group here. So I want to add a new group and say, this is my QA. So now I have an area where I can later have the functionality to call up my QA. Now I need to put in the button so that I can really press it and have the QA. I need to know where the QA button usually is. And it's either in the preparation or in the review. So you can just go into the ribbon where it usually is. Say, here is my quality assurance. And the run QA, that is something I want to have in my ribbon. So I add that to my group, if I click OK now, you will see I have this My QA area here. And if I click on it, My QA runs with the QA checker that I have set. You can also delete things. So if you say, I never use comments or I never use the marked markup for the text, you can maybe uh, delete the whole area. Again, if you go to right mouse click, customize the ribbon, open up the areas of the ribbon, say, okay, the comments and the proofing, that is something that I do 
in another ribbon. I don't need it here. I just remove it and it's gone. So that's a nice way to customize how you, or what you see in the ribbon. And then there is another way to customize. Let's go into the edit ribbon because here are the special characters. So there are some special characters that are already set up and then there are some frequent symbols, non-breaking spaces, dashes and so on. That can be customized so you can add new characters that you always want to use into this list and you can also have your own shortcut for them. So for example, I would like to have a shortcut that creates the yen symbol for me. I don't want to look that up, I always want to have it with a shortcut. Now the customization of the shortcuts only works if you have your own shortcut list. And that is something again that's in the options. So we would go into the options setting. There is an area for the keyboard shortcuts. And here you can see at the moment the default shortcuts are attached to the project. Um, the defaults cannot be changed because every time you get an update from MOQ it comes with all the default settings. So if you changed the default settings, an update of MemoQ would overwrite your changes and we don't want that. So we would create our own list. We would basically clone or copy the default. Give it a name and activate it so that it will be used in the projects that you're working on. Okay, so the next thing now would be to add the special characters. You can do that from here and say I want to customize the shortcuts. You would get a list of symbols and here for example is my yen symbol. I would like to have a certain shortcut for that. In this case I'm going to use control alternate and the letter Y. Hopefully that's a shortcut that has not been assigned yet to some other functionality. You might have to play around with that a little bit. Very important is to um, save it so that this shortcut really has that assigned um, symbol. Save the whole dialog and now if I want to type a short um, the yen symbol I use control alternate and Y. There comes my yen symbol and in the frequent symbols I also have the yen symbol now if I want to uh, use it with the mouse pointer. So especially if you have a keyboard that doesn't show all the characters that you need, um, then it's sometimes quite useful to put them into the shortcut list. All right. Now let's go back again to the options because there are quite a lot of things that you can customize there. And let's go to the appearance. The appearance has to do with the colors, with the sizes of, of the fonts in the translation editor. So let me show you. First of all, we have the font that is going to be used, in this case Tahoma, for um, everything that's not Chinese, Japanese or Korean. They have different fonts that are being used. And these fonts that you set here, they have nothing to do with the actual file. It is just the way the text is being shown in MemoQ. You've probably realized that whatever document lo you load, the font is always the same inside MemoQ, even though the font in the original files and in the translated files is not what you see in MemoQ. So this is really just to show the text in MemoQ. Then we have showing the non-printing characters, which you can also switch on with this uh, button here which also means that you can see all the spaces as those small dots between the words. And then we have colors for the tags. So first of all, text color, that's the color of the actual text you see. Then we have inline tags, which would be the gray ones that might come from uh, hyperlinks, from automatic um, fields in Word. It could be um, a picture, an image, um, placeholder. Quite a lot of things come up as tags. Then we have 
special tags. So if you decide to make something into a tag, that would have to be done with regular expressions and the regex tagger. So in this case, there were some placeholders in my text, which I made into tags. They only appear as tags in the text here in MemoQ. They would appear as pure text again when I export the file. And then we have the MemoQ tags, which would be the ones that come up in purple now and then. For example, if you combined two sentences that were separated by a line break, then in between you would have this placeholder coming up in purple, which actually means this is the placeholder for the line break. So if you don't like the colors of the tags, you can always change that. Also, the color of the text inside the tag at the moment is set to white, but you can change that as well. And then we have all the colors in the status column. So here you can see everything that's not started is in gray. Everything that is edited comes up in error orange. Everything that's pre-translated or the translation memory has put it in automatically comes up in blue. And um, I do have some clients who have a little bit of trouble distinguishing green and red tones. So for them, the orange and the green is not that easy to distinguish. So they would set other colors that they, they like better. The only thing you need to be careful about is there is no reset. As far as I have seen, there is no reset to get the original colors back. So be a little bit careful when you change a color, maybe make a note of the color uh, number. So for example, for pre-translated, if I click on the color button, I get the color set up. If you just mark down the numbers for the, um, for the actual tone and uh, color number, then you can always go back to that, to those colors and to that, or to those numbers and that color, uh, if you don't like the color anymore. Another thing that you can customize here with the colors are the lookup results, and the lookup results are the ones that you have in the translation results list. So first of all, we have a darker color for the actual area between the sentences that contains the match rate or the number. And then we have a lighter color that is the background color of the actual sentence pair. So this is something that you can customize. Again, make sure that you note down the numbers of the colors because there is no reset. Another thing you could do, you could uh, define what kind of matches you would like to see in the results list. So for example, I personally don't like the fragment assembly because that is something that can be quite um, confusing. If MemoQ takes a source sentence and exchanges known words so that I have a mixture of a source sentence with target sentence words in it, I don't want to see that. So I can say, I don't want to see fragment assembly. So from now on, although MemoQ still does it in the background, it will not come up in the list. On the other hand, for example, if I'm a, tr a terminologist and I rather want to work with terminology, not so much with the sentence pairs, I could say whatever comes from the term base is more important for me. I want to see that at the top of the list. So then you would move it up to the top and from now on the term base hits would come first and then you would have the sentence hits. You can also change the font size, so the size of the text that you see in the results list, in the translation grid as well. You can change the font size of the text by changing the font size here. Let me just make that a little bit bigger and apply it, and you will see the text gets bigger right away. And another setting for the colors, the colors that come up in Okay, I'll need to move that back. I'm sorry, because otherwise I can't get at my sentence pairs. Let's see. Okay, it doesn't update. Sorry, I'll have to close. Well, let's see, do the apply. Now it should come, yes. So, um, any colors that show the difference between the sentence from the document and the sentence from the translation memory, here marked in blue for additional terms, and marked in red if it's just uh, the same sentence but a, a, a changed term. So all these colors can be customized. Don't forget to use the apply and click OK. 
if you want to get back there, you can do it via the options, but you could also always do a right mouse click. And the customized appearance is down here in the context list as well. And you would go right away to that one dialog where you can customize the view of MemoQ Editor. All right, let's see what else I needed to show you. Oh yeah, um, spell checker. We need to set up a spell checker if we want to use one. <clears throat> there are two different um, spell checkers that can be attached to MemoQ. And again, we do that in the options. So in the options dialog, up here with the small gear wheels, there is the part for spelling and grammar. So here you would check the box that you want to check the spelling as you type, which gives you the red curly underline that you also know from Word. Then you would select the target language. That's the one we want to use the spell check on. And now you can decide if you want to use Microsoft Word, if that is installed on your machine, or if you want to use the Huntspell dictionaries. The Huntspell dictionaries are for free. They are available on the internet. You can install them from here. So you can say, I want to look for more dictionaries online. It would give you the web address. You can just say, I want to check if there is any dictionary that I can use. It might not be available for all the languages that you're using, but in this case, for example, I could say I want to have also the, the ones for um, German of Switzerland and German of Austria. I want to download the checked items. They would come up in the list of the available Huntspell dictionaries. And now I can select if I translate into German Germany, if I want to use all of those, or if I just want to use the one that really applies to uh, Germany. Oops, that one, not that one. Or maybe one that applies to all of them. So it really depends on which Huntspell dictionary you apply here, what kind of spell check you will get afterwards. Now we have two areas, the curly underlines and the spell checking dialogue. So you could use the curly underlines with Microsoft Word, but the spell checking dialogue with the Huntspell dictionaries, if you like. The grammar checker is something that only works with Microsoft Word. So if you have Word installed, then you can also use the grammar checker and you get those green underlines that you're used from um, Word when you work in Word alone. Now once you have set up the spell checker, if you decided which spell checker you would like to use, apply. And now you can use the spell checker. Well, one thing I would like to do is I would like to add some things. Here you can see the red underlines, the curly underlines. So I would now like to add some exceptions. So some things that the spell checker should not check, especially for product names or company names. For that, you can set up a so-called ignore list. So a list of words that should be ignored during spell check. That is something that you can set up in the so-called resource console. The resource console is the, um, yeah, the, the collection of all the databases of all the settings that are available in MemoQ. And here you would have the ignore lists. You can set up either, you can add to an existing list or maybe let's set up a new one. Okay, I set up a list to ignore for German spell checking. So once the list is created, I can now go and do the spell check. So I would run the spell check, either press F7 or in the translation ribbon, you can use the spell check. Now the spell check dialog should come up. Here we go. It recognizes that one of the words is not in the dictionary and it doesn't know what to do, so it asks me. So I now can say, I want to put that into the ignore list. Just go to the ignore list tab, say, I want to use this ignore list, and the word that has been found should be added to that list. And now you will see that word comes up again in the next segment, but it should not be checked now once I've set it to the ignore list. 
I'm going to add. And there you can see it jumped over it and went to the next one. So it's basically the same as the custom dictionaries that you know from Word. It, this is called an ignore list in MemoQ. All right. So talking about spelling and also terminology, we might as well talk about the, um, the term bases that you can attach to MemoQ. And you might have noticed, once you have installed MemoQ, you probably get a lot of terminology hits, even though you do not have a terminology database created yourself. And that's because when MemoQ is installed, it is by default connected to one of the online terminology databases. So again, let's go to the settings, to the options, and take a look at that. That's a so-called terminology plugin. So here I could say I want to use the terminology, the online terminology database. In this case, usually it's the Euro term bank. And let's see how that works. Apply that, click OK. There you can see it's going round and round and round and round, which means it's searching, searching in the term base. And it usually takes a little bit, but it should come up with, yes, a whole list of terminology. And all this now comes not from my own terminology database, but from the um, Euro term bank. And as you can see here, it's, there's a lot of stuff in. It might be helpful, but it's not very structured. So sometimes the list just gets too long and you would like to switch it off. So we're going to switch off the search for the Euro term bank. Terminology plugins, just switch either this one off or both of them and apply and OK. So now when I move to another sentence, you will see nothing happens. There is not this brown thingy that does the search, so no search in the Eurotron bank any longer. But we might want to search in terminology databases on the internet. We might have some online dictionaries that we really would like to use um, and that we want to connect to. And for that, MemoQ has something called the web search. So let's see. That should be in the quick access bar. There's the web search. But first, we need to set it up. So that is one of the so-called default resources. So that's a setting that uh, can apply to any project that you're working on. And again, we go to Options. And we come to the so-called default resources. Everything that you define here means that whenever you create a new project, these resources will be attached to the project. In this case, we're going for the web search. MemoQ already comes with two lists of dictionaries. And for example, here is the, the list of dictionaries that start with English as a source language. You can edit that. And you can say, I want to add some of the dictionaries that are being used when I do a web search. So maybe that could be something like, where is it? Lingui might be a nice one. There might be the Collins that we want to use, uh, whatever else. You can also add your own dictionary. For example, I have one that is not in the list here that I would like to add. So I say I want to add a new dictionary. First of all, I need to give it a name. That's the name that's being displayed in the list and in the back. So the dictionary is called dict. I'm going to put in the website. So, And now I can do a search and test it. So MemoQ has set up a test. It will be searching in this dictionary for the word linear regression. Let's try that. Hmm. The thing is, now it does call up the website, but it doesn't do the search right away. That's because it doesn't really know, um, because I'm only putting in the web page itself. In most of the online dictionaries, you would have to do a setting now and say, OK, I'm searching from German to English or English to German, things like that. And that is not specified here yet. So let me show you how to do that. Um. 
there we go. I'm going to open the page and now I need to find out how the online dictionary is doing its searches. So I would do the settings. I'm going from English to German. I'm going to search for uh, for the search term that MemoQ has put in. So I do the search and now you can see up in the address bar that's how this website is doing the search. So it not only has the name of the website but it also has some parameters where it says okay now the search starts. The question mark is start the search. S stands for search. The equal symbol means okay what comes after the equal symbol that's the actual term I'm searching for. So basically that's the structure I need to have in MemoQ. Let me just copy that. Go back to MemoQ. So that would be the structure but right now it would always search only for the word linear regression but I want to search for different words. At the moment I don't know which words so I need to set a placeholder for where these search terms are and that would be the curly brackets. So basically I just do a search in the um, online dictionary, I copy the link and where the search term is that I used I just put in as a placeholder these two brackets. Now let's see what happens. If I now do that search, do the test, there we go, it has searched for linear regression and here I get all the information that I need. So that's how you can set up your own online dictionary. Let's put it in here and it should come up in the list. I'll need to activate it. It goes to the top of the list and now let's see how that works. So I'll click OK and go back to my document and let's see if I can find something like um, the word module. I would like to look up the word module. I mark it, I do the web search and now I should get a browser window that has three tabs for the different dictionaries that I have selected and all of them should have run the search on the word module. And now you can do copy and paste from with here, within here to your translation document. So that I think is a really nice way to customize the search for terminology in MemoQ. So let's see, I think we have a lot of questions. Let me just go through them again. Okay. So there's a question that you don't see the view pane and no idea why you can't see it. Okay, yeah that can happen if the view pane for whatever reasons has been minimized to a very very small area at the bottom of the screen even if you switch on the view pane or switch it off you probably don't realize that it's there it's just not showing up. So you might want to check if there is the view pane maybe visible just at the very edge of your screen and try to make it a little bit bigger. That's very often the case if the view pane does not show up when you switch it in the view menu. So another question, is there a possibility of adding a new segment on the left hand side for example? The text I'm translating has been edited and a new sentence has been added to it. Yeah, well, you can change the source text but you cannot add a whole new segment. If you need to add text, you would need to add it inside of an existing segment. You can do that by either doing a right mouse click and say I want to edit the source or use the F2. And then you would um, be able to type some text which then could be translated on the right hand side. The only thing is you cannot have a line break in between those texts. But in essence it would be possible if you add text to an existing segment. Okay, a question here on the preview. My translation agency often does not provide the preview. Um, preview is not available. Okay, it can happen that 
down here in this area, um, you see that the preview is not available. The thing is that MemoQ cannot show preview for all sorts of files. The preview is available for Word files, PowerPoint, Excel, HTML, so websites. For XML files, you will see a text view of the file, but it usually does not provide a preview for FrameMaker files, InDesign files only if they're converted through the language terminal, but usually not. Um, any type of bilingual file that was sent by the client, if they sent XLIF files for translation or if these files come from Trado Studio, for example, these would also not have a preview. So it might be that it has to do with the file format that is being used to create a MemoQ project that you either see a preview or you don't see a preview. So another one, when you have a segment with several rows and you want to scroll down the rows, the edit mode with the cursor blinking will not jump from segment to segment, but will first scroll through the separate rows in the active segment. Okay, yeah, I, I think I know what you mean. It's like if you have a segment that is really, really big and you have this small scroll bar on the side to scroll inside of the segment. If you move from line to line, it will move inside the segment from line to line. I'm sorry that this is something that cannot be customized. So here, it, there's really no way to, um, if you use the cursor keys, to jump to the next segment with that. It would go through the whole segment. Uh, I think clicking in that case is probably easier and faster. So another question, how do you unmark text? Oh yeah, that's a good one. Happens to me all the time. Um, if you are in the quick access bar, let's say edit, I did delete that. Let's see, where is that? Oh, I deleted that part. I'll have to get it back, sorry. Let me just customize my ribbon so that I have, let's see, that was in the, should be in the edit probably. Format, formatting group. Oh no, I can't find it back. My goodness, maybe in the review. Let's see, yeah, comments and proofing, exactly. So I need the comments and proofing again so that I have it up. Okay, sometimes it can happen that you accidentally click on this button. And then once you mark something, Oh my God, now it's going to mark everything with a color. In here, there is nothing to unmark something with that color. But you might have seen that once I marked something, a comment was created. So if you take a look at the comment, you can either do a double click here or go into the view pane and see the active comments. If you delete that comment, then you also delete the color from the highlighting. If you don't want to use the highlighting any longer, you can see it's attached to my cursor. You just click on Mark Text again, and then it should be gone. So is it possible to make a non-breaking space visible, like in Word? Yes, if you have a non-breaking space, let me just change this one to a non-breaking space. Oops, that was the wrong key combination. Um, there we go. So that was um, control, shift, and the space bar. So a non-breaking space would come up as this small circle. Looks very much like a degree symbol. Okay, another question. I have two documents to translate, and I pre-translated pre both of them. How can I make sure when I change segments in the first document after the pre-translation, the identical segments in the second document change along? Okay, good question. If you have several documents that need to be changed in the same way, I would go with a so-called view. Let me just close all my documents so that I can show you. So just imagine these are the two documents that have been pre-translated, and now you want to go through the whole thing again and maybe change some of the pre-translated stuff and make sure that whatever you change in document one also changes in document two. I would mark them, would say create a view, 
which means simply glue all the documents together. Oops, sorry, I switched somehow to Chinese input method. Let's go back here. Give the view a name. And then there will be a second tab where the view, where the combined document is. So we would open that. It just behaves like a regular document. And then you would go to the, um, if it's exactly the same sentences that you're talking about. So if there is one sentence like this here, there's a new sentence. Later on, the same sentence comes up again in the other document and you want the auto-propagation to work, then you could go to the translation ribbon, translation settings, auto-propagation, and you would say overwrite confirmed segments, for example. So that even if the segment had been confirmed for, by the pre-translation, for example, once you change this first instance, it would be changed throughout all of the documents that are combined in this view. So you don't have to open each and every document on its own, but you can do it one, uh, in one uh, long list. Okay, is there also a way to adjust the ribbon in MemoQ 2014? I'm afraid not. This is a new feature that came up in MemoQ 2015. So, another question. How can you stop MemoQ from providing an automatic translation for segments that contain word from glossaries? It looks like machine translation. Oh yes, you're absolutely right. This is something that's the fragment assembly. And um, as I've shown you, you can switch it off so that it doesn't show up in the translation results list. But unfortunately, it is also set by default in the pre-translation. So if you do a pre-translation, preparation ribbon, pre-translate, be sure to uncheck the box, perform fragment assembling, because that is something that you really don't want in your text. It's, it's a combination of source text with changes or uh, things exchanged from a glossary or from short concordance hits, for example. So that should be unchecked. And if you have machine translation systems connected to MemoQ, but you don't want to use them during pre-translation, also uncheck the box to use the machine translation. So it has all to do with the pre-translation settings. Okay. Now here, a case for considerable time saving. Can I come up with a solution? Got a number of notes that begin with note. And is followed by an annotation that needs translation. Is there a way of translating only this text once and for all throughout the document? Ah, the thing is, if they're inside one, well, if, if this text note, like, okay, let's just fake it. So if the text note comes up several times in your document as a single segment, Then the auto-propagation, if you translate the first one, it would be translated all the way through. If that segment contains also other text, then no, I'm afraid you cannot pre-translate everything at the same time. So that would be something, um, maybe do a copy and paste, maybe search for everything that starts with note, then do um, a copy for everything, and then do a search and replace on the target text where you say note becomes my translated text for note. And then the text afterwards just needs to be changed manually. That's the only way that I could come up with to really do a text change if there is more text than just this in the segment. Okay, another question on the spelling. Spelling tab. The language dependent settings are grayed out on my side. Now, I'm not really sure where you are at the moment. So, is it the options? Let's go to the options and to the spelling and the grammar. You will have to choose a language. So, the target language that you're dealing with. If that is chosen, then nothing should be grayed out. If that's not what you were looking at, please send me another question. So here it says, I cannot download any dictionaries. I get an error message, FTP not available. Hmm, that's strange. 
because usually it should work. What you could do is, um, if you look for the online dictionaries, just um, try to find the Hunspell website. I'm not sure if that is the whole web page that you could use. Let me just try. I'm going to copy that, put that into the address bar, and see if that's, that is the website for Hunspell. It's trying to connect to something. Okay, so we'd have to search for the Hunspell dictionary website and download the dictionaries from there if it doesn't work from here. I'm sorry, I don't know why that would be that the FTP server cannot be connected to. So the question, do we have to select the spell checker for every job? Um, no. As soon as you have set the spell checker in the options for whatever target languages you want to translate into, like if you have five target languages you deal with, you would set the spell checker for all of these. So for German, I have chosen Microsoft. For, let's say, for Spanish, I would go with the Huntspell dictionaries. For um, if English is the target language, I would use Microsoft for the curly underlines, but Huntspell for the checking dialog. MemoQ will remember these settings. So whatever target language you set, MemoQ will remember the settings for the spell checker that you've done. So another question, why is a word still underlined even if it is in the ignore list? Um, that's because the that's because the curly underlines and the spell checking dialog are two separate entities. So um, if you say, I don't want to check the spelling as I type, then the curly underline is gone, but all of it is gone. So it's not like if it's in the ignore list, it doesn't come up with the curly underlines. It's just that the um, spell checking dialog doesn't stop when this word comes up. Are there any confidentiality issues with plugins and web searches if I work on confidential documents? I would say yes, um, especially if you use machine translation settings, because whatever you do, you're sending sentence by sentence to the machine translation system. And a lot of these machine translation systems, they have it in their terms and conditions that whatever text you send to them, it's theirs to keep. They can do whatever they like with it. So if you go through a whole document like a patent or a contract and send every sentence to the machine translation system, in the end, they basically have the, the whole document. So yes, there, there actually is an issue with using um, not so much the terminology plugins, but online translation memories and uh, machine translation systems. These would be confidentiality issues, and I would probably not use them if the client does not want me to use them. Okay, another question. How did you show the list of websites for the web search? Okay, in the options, in the default resources, where there is this icon for the world, that's the web search, and here are the two lists of existing dictionaries that MemoQ already has. You would just go to edit, and then you would see the whole list of the existing dictionaries. Okay, how can I tell MemoQ to ignore a footnote that is not to be translated, but left as it is in the source language? Um, the only way you could do that to tell MemoQ to ignore something that should not be translated is either prepare the file in such a way that this text is hidden text so that it does not show up in MemoQ, or you would need to, um, let me just switch off filter here, or you would basically need to lock it. So you would mark the line um, and go to preparation, lock segments, or you could do a double click on that small red cross, and that would also lock the segment. And now it would be ignored by, um, by the analysis. You can jump over it if you don't want to touch it. But either prepare the source file so that it doesn't even go into MemoQ, or you would need to um, hide it away in such a way that you lock it. And then you could say, OK, show me only the unlocked, the not locked segments. Then you would not even see it. 
All right, I see we do have still a lot more questions in the line, and I'm going to answer all of them by email because our time, unfortunately, is up. I hope that some of the things that I showed you to make MemoQ a little bit more customized will be helpful for your daily work. If you still have any questions, please feel free to put them into the questions list. I will leave it on for another few minutes, and I will definitely get back to you all by email with the answers to the questions. So thank you very much for joining me for this webinar. As I said, the webinar has been recorded. It will be up on the MemoQ website within the next week or so. And I now wish you a really nice evening, and thanks again for being here. And thank you very much for all your feedback. It looks like a lot of people found this helpful. That's great. That's really good to know. Thanks so much. All right. It looks like everybody is now leaving the session and all the questions have been asked, hopefully. <laughs> I will close the session and thanks again for being with me. I'll get back to you by email.